Welcome back to The Short Game. This is a show about short video games, games that respect your time. I'm Reagan Kelly, and I'm joined at the moment by one awesome co-host, Laura Nash. How are you doing, Laura? I'm doing great. I'm excited to record an episode with two spooky ghost co-hosts. Yes, this week our co-ghosts are uh, Nate and Shane. Yes, boo indeed. Uh, Nate and Shane are here in spirit. Uh, They're actually going to be joining us in a bit. Because of uh, scheduling conflicts, we are recording this episode in two parts. So first I'm talking to Laura about her games that she's played for IF Comp. And then we'll be switching gears and talking with Shane and Nate separately. But otherwise, the format's going to be pretty much the same. Uh, If you are just joining us, this is the third episode and probably the final episode of our coverage of IF Comp 2018. Uh, IF Comp is closing on November 15th. And after that, the votes will be tallied and the winners will be announced. And we will probably come back to just talk about what won. But this is probably our last episode of IF Comp coverage before the close of the competition. Um, so we'll be talking about some of the games that we have uh, played since the last episode and just sort of recapping a little bit about the competition for this year. So as always, IF Comp has a ton of games, almost 80 this year, and we are not playing all of them, but we're trying to play as many as possible, hence three parts. So we hope you're playing along to actually judge yourself you just have to play five so you can always look back through our recommendations or just find out what's under 15 minutes if you ain't got much time Uh, but we really do encourage you to judge along with us it's a huge part of the fun i mean how many times do you get to actually vote in a game competition yeah and uh this one is always a surprise you know the the results are always really interesting one of the things that i love about if comp is once they release the results it's not just here's the top 10 or something like that, they give you a surprising amount of detailed information about the statistics of how the comp actually worked out. So you can see things like, you know, what, uh, what had the highest number of, uh, you know, fives versus the highest number of ones, what had the highest standard deviation, Uh, you get a little graph for every single game to see how the votes were distributed. Sometimes that's really interesting to see sometimes more polarizing games get a lot of a lot of high and low and sometimes games end up right in the middle and sometimes the real gems end up with nothing but fives. So it's really interesting uh, time even after the comp finishes to just sort of go back through. Sorry. Tens? Oh, one to 10 oh I, yeah, I guess you're right. Sorry, I was thinking it was one to five for some reason. Doesn't matter. Anyway, you get a nice distribution. You get little graphs. Reagan it's clearly cool. has not judged his games yet. No, I haven't put my numbers in yet. <laughs> Usually my approach for that at the end of the comp is I just sort of take all of the games that I've played. I kind of lay them out. I tend to just pick a few favorites and give those the top number and kind of work my way down from there. But it's it's sometimes hard. A lot of people have very specific ways that they decide on their numbering schemes for this. I'm kind of just, uh, you know, I just pick numbers, you know, pick scores for the games kind of based on gut feeling and and trying to decide what I think needs to float to the top. So, And dear listeners, we will not tell you our numerical scores right. on anything because we don't want to sway you. Right. And often we don't know until we've played more games. Yeah. And often we don't know until I actually have to put in my numbers because, like I said just a moment ago, I thought it was scoring out of five for, for, for a minute there. Please don't give all your favorite games five. No, I definitely won't. So, um, so I've played uh, – I have two games to discuss today. The first one I wanted to talk about is uh, Boogeyman or Boogeyman. They use the, I guess it's the British spelling, right? B O G E Y M A N. Yeah. So uh, this is Boogeyman or Bogeyman by uh, Elizabeth Smith or Smythe, also a British spelling. Smith. <laughs> right? I know. It's Smith. Anyway, this is a really neat game. Um, this was one that I was really looking forward to trying because I'd seen some other folks talking about it and it sounded very much up my alley. Uh, it's a choice-based game. I think it took me about an hour to get through. Um, and uh, it's of that sort of style of choice-based game where you actually aren't making a lot of choices minute to minute. You do have some choices as you go, but uh, it's mostly about the the text is presented in this very stark white on black kind of vibe and, you know, very short passages of text, lots of use of caps for ominous effect. 
Um, and the music of the game is also very creepy. It's got uh, several pieces of music. It has a different piece of backing music for each kind of act. And overall, the whole effect is a very creepy game. Um, probably one of the more effective horror-oriented uh, choice or twine-based games that I, I can think of. Uh, really, really up there in terms of just spooky presentation, which was great because I played it right around Halloween and it was real spooky. Um, it's uh, the premise is that you, you're, this is a game about what happens to children when they are carried off by the boogeyman. Uh, you know, if you're a bad child and uh, your parents don't love you or something, uh, then you are carried off in a sack by the boogeyman. The, the game opens with you are playing as a girl who has just been carried off by the boogeyman. You wake up uh, with a thud and you're being dropped out of a sack onto a horrible hovel floor in a terrible, you know, ramshackle house. And this horrible, scary, very spooky man has this collection of children in this horribly dingy place. And I have to say, like, this game, most of this is carried by just like this, not just spookiness is really not the right way to put it. This is just a truly distressing game. So first off, as a as a, a warning, if um, if you're particularly distressed by child abuse, descriptions of child abuse, um, then this might not be the game for you because this is this is a game about like children being terrorized by an incredibly horrible, malevolent, incredibly powerful person. And I don't want to give away any of the really unsettling surprises of the game. It has a really interesting story. Um, it is a really bleak, bleak game. Um, and in terms of choices, like, I don't, I don't think there's a way to get away from... I only played it through once. I don't think there are... I don't know how many endings this potentially has. It doesn't feel like the sort of game that was designed to be, like, play through this multiple times until you get the good ending, like a lot of choice-based games kind of are. You know, so I, I think this really is sort of intended as a one-and-done one and experience. But I, there may very well be multiple endings worth exploring this game again for. I'm not sure I'm kind of there for that, because it was so distressing. Mm. Um, and really just nasty. Uh, lots of descriptions of children being forced to do horrible, disgusting chores, being abused physically, not in a, not in a like child sexual abuse kind of way, but like in a, in a very kind of unsettling, sad, way. sad physical and emotional abuse kind of way. It's, it's a very distressing game. And it's also very effective. So, like, it's it's spooky and scary and unsettling and otherworldly. You know, it's uh, the boogeyman is an incredibly creepy character. And you do want to, even though he's horrible, you want to know more about, like, why and how is he carrying children from, you know, wherever they come from to this sort of netherworld that he lives in and, you know. Um, where do the children go? It's clear you're not the first one to 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 be dropped here, but there's only five. Um, it seems like there's sort of a revolving door of children. Where are the other children going? And I I, I don't think it's a spoiler to say it's not a it's not a good thing. It's it's not a it's not a happy discovery when you find out. It's very distressing. So if that doesn't put you off, um, it's really really well written. The the writing is just like super effective at carrying off that creepy, distressing vibe. So I, I would say this is probably going to place really high in, in the comp. Um, I, I definitely liked it. I'm glad I played through it. I don't think I'm going to play through it again because I don't, I, I don't think there's a good end. I don't think there's a more satisfying ending than the truly depressing ending that I got. I mean, even if I, even if there is a better ending, it can't possibly be uplifting. So um, it's it's a really, really neat choice based game with really good writing and really, really distressing subject matter that I definitely recommend if you uh, if you're interested in that sort of thing. That sounds like a game I don't know when I'm going to play it. That's OK. Um, I mean, it sounds wonderful. I think the for me, the really distressing games when I play them, I love them. Uh, there is a bit of a barrier to entry, but I also I want to ask, does it make you feel 
responsible for the actions against the children? Like, no. do you have to make choices to torture them? Okay. No. That's something that yeah, I've seen I exactly in some know what you mean. Before. Yeah. So if it's if you're playing as a kid and you kind of are getting out, you have I guess agency to get out of the situation. That seems like a game I'm much more. Yeah, yeah. No, you're do. definitely. If it's a game where you were torturing children as the bogeyman, mm. like that seems like something I might have not been for Laura's. Yeah, mm. no, not not that at all. So, um, it, it's mostly not a monster sim. <laughs> no, thank God. No, you're um, you're playing as a child, and you're um, uh, most of the sort of conflict of the game, most of the choice in the game, the boogeyman is telling these children that if they're just good children, that everything will be okay. And he's, you know, that they deserve to be here because they're bad. And most of your choices are about, do I rebel against the boogeyman, even though that seems futile? Or do I kind of like knuckle under and hope for mm. hope that, you know, hope that whatever this system is comes out right in the end. Like maybe I am supposed to just obey the boogeyman and maybe then I'll get to go home. Um, so it's most of your choices are about that kind of trade off. And I don't think there's a way to get out of this game with both your um, life and integrity. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you give in to the boogeyman, you might get out, but also that's so much sadder in a way. Yeah. No, I, 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 that's a really interesting conundrum. Uh, it sounds like a good decision. Mm -hmm. Like one of those moments where you kind of move your mouse back and forth between two and you don't really like either choice, but honestly, you don't have any other choices. That's, that's a really, I, I really appreciate IF that gives me that. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's really well presented. Um, I, I, uh, just the, the sort of stark black page with the white text and when the boogeyman speaks, he has a sort of a different font. And uh, the the music is really the standout here. Not all Twine or choice-based games even bother to have music. And when they do, sometimes you find these kind of repetitive pieces that don't really do much for the experience. Um, these are like lengthy, creepy, well-done music that I'm pretty sure is specifically composed for this work based on the, the end credits, I, th I think anyway. And it's really good music for what, for, 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 for the vibe they're going for here. Excellent. Well, for something completely different. <laughs> when you don't have a, a transition. <laughs> I mean, there's no real transition here, but I played a lot of murder mysteries this year. Uh, that seems to be the trend of my IFF. Oh, yeah. It really seems like a theme this year, like a lot of them. Yeah. But as I mentioned last time, I just started erstwhile. Um, and I got really excited because I kind of got through an opening where I was murdered at Thanksgiving and my ghost is going to figure it out. I'm going to figure out who killed me at the Thanksgiving potluck. That's a really fun premise. Oh, it's such a fun premise and it's hilarious. And I finished it and it was everything I wanted. Uh, last time I had just gotten to a point where the world had seemingly opened up and I could kind of drop into people's memories and uh, I was starting to interview people, and I found out you could link together different memories. Um, and I, but I hadn't really done anything other than you know realize I could hit the link button. Uh, where I ended up with erstwhile, um, as I played it, when you start, you can interview a bunch of people, and then you can kind of drop into their perspective, see their go into their memories, start going into their minds get clues from their homes or their, their different places they are in their memory. And then you can start linking them together and it kind of makes this mix and match way of uh, putting together memories. It's really, really neat. And I got tremendously excited that um, on Emily Short's blog, a guest author um, wrote up what made this mechanic so good in a much more coherent way than I'm describing it. So I'll just read some of it. He or she uh, says that in erstwhile, memories are treated like physical objects. After experiencing someone else's memory, you can save it for later, essentially adding it to your inventory. And then they talk about linking it. Um, 
And they said, this mix and match approach to various perceptions of reality is unlike anything else I saw in the competition. Making the player an active participant in the creation of a story may be a primary characteristic of IF, but making them an active participant in creating the backstory, especially in this way, is much less common. So That's really interesting. I was not expecting this really funny um, Thanksgiving murder mystery. First of all, so many props so much love for making it a thanksgiving murder mystery and not a halloween party um (laughs) the fact that i i got poisoned and turned into a ghost at thanksgiving was just great and all of the neighbors uh, at the potluck um were sufficiency were sufficiently weird or quirky or bizarre and not most a lot of them didn't like me and i was very irked to find out that my friends just were merely tolerating me um but Often you get quirky, fun writing, or you get a new mechanic. You don't tend to get both in the same one. So I really appreciated that complexity. Um, And it's a game where I think I got most of it because I got through the story. But I could definitely see there being other linkages that probably revealed more backstory of my friends that really deepens the game. Very surprising. So I just wanted to give a little bit more deep uh, review of erstwhile since I had barely touched on this and it really paid off. That is awesome. Yeah, I actually really want to try that one. It's probably one of the games that I haven't played that I'm most interesting and interested in giving a try. Um, I have a kind of a list going of things that I'm probably not going to be able to talk about on the podcast, but that I at least want to try to play before the end of the comp so that I can rate them or at least, you know, know what everyone is talking about. Uh, I always hate being kind of left out if it, if a game like ranks really high. I'm like, oh, I haven't, didn't get to play that yet. Yeah, we were, uh, before we recorded, Rick and I were bemoaning that often trying to cover a really broad range, we don't uh, necessarily get to cover the things that other people are so tremendously excited about. Uh, I will say that erstwhile is a good time. Awesome. It sounds super fun. And maybe a uh, maybe a good antidote if you've played uh, Boogeyman and need something to lighten the mood. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of different murder mystery this year. Um, there's been a lot of atmospheric games I've played and a lot of kind of supernatural spooky tinged games. So it is very fun to have a game with ghosts and murder that is on the lighter side of the spectrum. Well, the next game I played is Within a Circle of Water and Sand, and that's a game that I actually ended up really liking a lot. This game is a choice-based, maybe hour to two hour long, uh, you know, choice-based narrative type of deal, but uh, it it struck me by, it surprised me in a few ways. The first thing that really surprised me about this game uh, was that its structure is a little more traditional in the choose your own adventure vibe. I've gotten so used to when I see choice based on one of these uh, these descriptions, so used to these games being the the style that I think Twine and tools like it very much are kind of tailored towards, which is presenting relatively short passages of text and then giving you a lot of things to click on. Um, this game, is the presentation feels a little different in that you're tending to see very long passages of text, particularly at the start. Um, like when you first open the game, you will read two or three pages of text before you get to anything that you can click on. And even that first thing you click on isn't a choice. It's just basically a next page button. So lots of text right up front. But it was very engaging text. And it, the the choices are um, more in the sort of choose your own adventure kind of vibe. Um, I'll kind of explain why, more what I mean about that in a minute. But the the premise of the game is that you are, I guess the easiest way to explain it without going into a bunch of detail is that it's kind of Moana-y. Um, you're playing as a, a girl who is from a, a a village on an island in what I assume is the Pacific. Um, Polynesian. Yeah. And po- yeah, Polynesian kind of island vibe. Um, and you, you're 17 years old and you are leaving home uh, as part of a rite of passage Uh, it kind of describes it as something that's mostly done ceremonially where people only go out for like an afternoon, but you have decided that you're not going to settle for that. You're exploring the world on your canoe. So you're on this journey of discovery and stopping at every island that you can find as you explore the sea. And you happen upon uh, an atoll that is made up of several islands 
and a girl swims up to your canoe um, and invites you back to her village to uh, to celebrate some kind of a feast because it's this girl that you meet. It's her, uh, her, she's also about to go through a kind of, uh, adulthood ceremony as well. And I'm wants like, you to it join cannibalism. It. Is it cannibalism? No, no, okay. I, n- 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 no, 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 spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. It's not, it's not cannibalism. Exactly. <laughs> um, so sorry. I, I just watched, Sabrina. So oh yes. Guess. Speaking of man, that show is so good. Um, Sorry, back to yes. So th- uh, the uh, the story is back to not cannibalism. <laughs> so so the story is is interesting enough. You know, I liked the character right off the bat, and the writing is 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 well done and and engaging. Sometimes when I open up one of these games, and the first thing you see is two to three pages of text without any choices, I think. Ugh. But this is really like engaging text. And they've also illustrated it beautifully. So almost every page, now the pages tend to be pretty long, but almost every page has some kind of an illustration. And the illustrations are these incredibly well done, very, I think they're digital paintings, but they're very painterly looking illustrations um, that give you a real sense of this sort of tropical vibe. And it's, um, it's beautifully done. Um, so you're, you're brought back to the island, you celebrate this uh, sort of feast and you have some opportunity to choose which people to talk to and kind of gather information, try to get a sense of like what this tribe that you're meeting with is all about. And there are some very strange and mysterious things. And then um, you're, uh, you have some free time to explore the atoll. So I don't think it's a spoiler. It's kind of in the description that you're, um, part of part of the plot is that you're being challenged to a race, a swimming race against this girl. So her, um, her rite of passage is to, to beat an outsider at a swimming race. And, um, if you just go straight for the swimming race, you will lose. And losing is, it's more than just losing a swimming race. I'll just put it that way. Um, so what really is interesting about this game is that it be, 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 it's meant to be played several times, and in between the uh, the sort of initial intro sequence where you are meeting the villagers and exploring the island, and the swimming race, which makes up kind of the conclusion of the game, there's a sort of an in-between point where it shows you a map of the atoll, and you have the option to explore the islands that make up this circle of islands, you know, circle of water and sand. And um, you don't have enough time to explore it entirely in one go. Um, and there are many hazards involved in exploring it. So you're, you're told by the girl, well, don't go to that island. That's where, uh, that's where the witch lives. And, you know, don't go to that island. That's where the old sluggard lives. And, you'll, you know, they're dangerous places. So there's, there's danger all around this atoll. So you have to play through this game several times usually to, um, to figure out how to actually win the race. Um, which I loved the investigation mechanic of that. It was really, it really kind of drew me in each time that you lose. Um, it, first of all, it gives you some achievements, which I don't usually see in these kinds of games that say like, you did this, you did that, you did this. And you can see that there's a bunch of achievements that you didn't get. And also it will, um, it will give you an optional hint at the end, uh, that will give you some idea of what you could do differently. And when you replay it, um, you can either start over from the beginning and play through the intro again, which can sometimes be useful because there are some different options for gathering information during that initial um, sort of feast scene, or you can jump straight to the beginning of the trial, beginning of the, um, uh, of, I think it also let, depending on how you, how well you did, it either can jump you to the beginning of the exploration portion or back into the portion where you're meeting the people at the feast or you have the option to just jump straight back into the um, into the um, uh, the race again, and um, the mechanics of all of it are mostly just you know it reads out some text and you have a choice. The choices are mostly about like which island to explore and um, you know how to approach them. Do you tie up your canoe far away and try to swim in stealthily, or do you go straight up to the island? Um, that kind of thing. Um, but all of the story of it was really interesting. I thought the writing was great. Um, I played, it took me, um, five playthroughs before I finally beat the, the game. And there were still a couple of achievements that I hadn't unlocked. Um, so I think it's a really nicely structured game. Um, 
and it kind of gave me like a renewed like belief, I guess, in this sort of format, this very choose your own adventure format, because this has some of that vibe of a choose your own adventure book where it's like you come to the end of the page, you have a choice to either, you know, go deeper into the cave or back out and leave. And one of those will end in you dying. Um, and then you start over. It has a lot of that. And I kind of thought of that as like old fashioned and maybe not that fun. But this game does a really great job with that format. Um, so if that sounds appealing to you, like this is a, a great tropical experience with a twist. There's a real twist that I've been talking my way around here uh, that is really interesting. You know, when you discover the true nature of this tribe and island and atoll, it's very interesting. And you'll want then to go back and play it again and try to explore and try to arm yourself so that when you try again at that race, you don't lose rather dramatically. Um, so really, really neat game. And um, one of my favorite choice-based things I've played for this comp so far. So I definitely recommend checking this game out. Um, I'm not familiar with the author. Uh, the author is uh, listed as uh, Romain. Or Roman, depending. Oh, you're right. It's probably Roman. Roman? It depends on, yeah. Yeah, I think he's French. Um yeah, the, the author on the IF comp page is listed just as Roman or Romain, R-O-M-A-I-N. Um, in the actual uh, credits of the game, it's uh, Roman Baudry. And, but apparently this game is a translation. It says that an early version of it um, was written in French for Yastromo 2011. I don't know what that is, but I'm assuming it's another uh, comp. Um, but then uh, Roman uh, reworked it. He did the translation. He created the map. That's something I didn't really mention. The exploration happens on an actual map, and you don't always oh, see that. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. Yes. And it's really nice because it'll show you a little symbol to show you what island you're at, and then you can tap on other islands to see what they're called, and you can tap to travel to it, and it shows a little like uh, line that goes across that says, you know, you went from this island to this island. And it keeps track of things like when you learn – that this island is the island that a particular character lives on, um, the next time that you play through it, it won't just say an anonymous looking island. It'll say so-and-so's island, that kind of thing. So it uh, it kind of builds on itself as you go. Um, but yeah, it's got these beautiful illustrations by uh, Klaus uh, Pion, P-I-L-L-O-N. Anyway, beautiful illustrations. Um, I wholeheartedly recommend this game. I think it's a really, really nice uh, example of a choice-based game that isn't doing anything super dramatically interesting mechanically, although I think that the way that it handles its investigation with the map is really cool. Um, but it's just really well pulled off. So um, definitely recommend it. So about how long did that end up being? Well, I, I played through it uh, five times. I think the first time I played through beginning to untimely end, which I didn't, I did, the first time through, I don't think I even got all the way to the beginning of the race. Um, uh, <laughs> you, yeah, you can very easily die during the investigation portion. Very Hitchhiker's Guide-ish. Yeah. Um, I think that the first time through, it took me 40 minutes, something like that, because I was reading all of this lengthy intro text. Um, mm -hmm. Subsequent playthroughs, um, you get to mostly skip or skim those longer text portions. And so they became a lot faster. Um, but maybe, uh, I think, altogether... Until from the first time I played through it to beating the game, maybe an hour and a half would be a guess. Okay. That's fair. Uh, I also played a game on the longer side for my next game, uh, Grim Noir. Play on the words Grimoire, which there is one in this game. There definitely is a Grimoire, a book of magical beasts that you are using in your job as a monster hunter hmm. it is a noir and grim as someone who watched way too much of the terrible show grim which was just what if cops were solving crimes about monsters from fantasy literature <laughs> never never had the opportunity to watch that one it's it's real bad but i've watched three or four seasons of it. It's a kind of show where they would actually like show a witch where they didn't call a witch. Um, they would show a witch doing something bad and they would play season of the witch over the top. Oh Lord. Yeah. Anyway, that embarrassing TV history aside, Grim Noir by pro P or prop, depending on 
who it is, um, is an actual noir. It's, it's in that kind of detective thing. They actually make fun of the guy. He's like, someone says at some point, when are you going to stop dressing like you're from the 1950s? Um, but it's got a bunch of that um, detective, and it's literally has the sound of rain coming through the windows. Mm. But it's got a ton of the, uh, you know, supernatural. Um, the hook is basically you have a bunch of different cases. You start off with three. And you're in your office and you can pick any of the cases to go on. You go to a case and you do an investigation and you're trying to identify the monster, demon, cursed beast that you are looking at. You get the information, you consult your grimoire, and then you confront it. And if you pick the right name of the creature, then you stun it. And then if you figure out the purpose like the motivation, the idea is that humans become these creatures. So if you can figure out who it is and what their motivation was to become the creature and, and attack or steal or whatever, then you purify their soul and they are released. So you can murder creatures or you can figure out the motivation of the creature and let it pass on. So... Something I really loved is this mix of noir and uh, supernatural comes in literally on the first page. You have an assistant named Soline, and description says she's usually dressed in a low-cut, tight dress, the deep red of either wine or serious blood loss, depending on her mood. <laughs> and then um, later on, Soline stares flatly at me and then shoots a disgusted look at my shoes on the desk. Golden cat slitted eyes broadcast her annoyance in my general direction. Asleep on the job while I do all the work, huh? She says. Your eyes are showing, I tell her. Her eyes instantly cut to a rich brown, and she tosses a manila folder at me. Murder and a theft, she says, and a man who insists on speaking to you in person. <laughs> so I was like, cool, I'm in. Maybe she's a cat goddess. Maybe she's something else. I was like, hopefully I, she's not killing people because I would like her just to be awesome. Um, you keep doing these little mini cases. You end up doing eight cases, nine if you figure out how to unlock like an extra case. But you go to the investigation, release these things. Uh, and it sounds really straightforward, but you have this like hub active case thing. You can get a menu with your inventory. You can, you know, call your assistant for help. You can do all these different things check your encyclopedia, figure out how to defeat things. But what I really liked about it is you also can go get coffee at the diner across the street and have conversations. Or you can go hang out with your friend at the mortuary. You know, There's a lot of the, the um, noir characteristics, the noir things, but they've always got a little tinge of the supernatural. So it's a game that has a surprising amount of world building for something that seems super straightforward. Um, at the end, uh, you get statistics, and the statistics include monsters killed, souls purified, and coffees consumed at Dermot's. <laughs> and it's that kind of thing that is super charming. I'm always a bit of a sucker for the sort of noir vibe uh, mashed up with other things. That's always kind of a, a good decision to make, I think. Yeah, it's not revolutionary, but the writing is really solid. Um, it keeps the noir tone, which is always kind of dark and serious without um, – and but I think the honest silliness of you investigating supernatural stuff uh, lets it get a little bit – more metaphorical you can you know have little tales of grief or little tales of you know some things end up being kind of funny um sometimes people are in weird situations sometimes the people aren't actually really doing much of a crime but you have to decide you know you caught some guy but he's not really doing much like what do you do with him um it's really uh fun and as i said I was really shocked there were eight different cases um, by the time you finish because you keep kind of getting middle of folders on your desk and most of these are over at three, but they do kind of two rounds. You get your first three as an intro, you get your second set um, and they kind of mount in either seriousness or risk as you go on. It sounds like a pretty big game. Did you end up completing it? 
I did complete it. I uh, accidentally closed the browser and hadn't saved. So I, I about 25 minutes in, which wasn't too bad because I didn't have to read it. Uh, I completed it. I'd say it's about an hour 45 to two hours. Hmm, okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's the one qualm I will have, little quibble, is that the grimoire, uh, you can't open it in a new browser and you it's built in twine. So it's not like you click on it and can click on another one right away. You have to keep going back mm. from like a hub. So it can get really annoying um, if you are having a trouble remembering which beast, you know, which of these beasts are cats. Like it's not a searchable index. Um, if you don't have a great short term memory or you aren't familiar with a lot of these creatures, you might be spending a lot of time revisiting things in the grimoire. Mm, okay. So just a, a thing to keep in mind. Um, small quibble, but maybe just take some notes and you won't have to keep looking it up as often. Yeah, I am surprised that this comp I played several long games. I tend to play maybe only one or two long games and mostly do uh, 30 minutes or under. But <laughs> That's it seems long like games in of... quotes. Long games for IF comp are like for IF comp. over an hour, which is like, wow, what a blessing. These games are all so short. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I just think this year it seems like there's been more extremes or maybe I've just gravitated towards the extremes where mm -hmm. a lot of my games were playing, um, you know, at least an hour to get a couple of, of the endings or two hours to play through once. So um, I haven't necessarily played as broadly as I might have in the past, but I've definitely played at least five, so I get to judge. Yep. And because this is our last episode before judging... Um, I thought it might be good for us just to mention a few other games that either we wanted to try but haven't uh, haven't had time to fully – or maybe games that we either tried a little bit of but hadn't had time to fully explore but that might be worth a look or games that just are on our list of things that we wish we had time to cover on this show or to, to, to go into more depth about but haven't been able to yet. Um, I know I have a, few, a list of games that – Probably as soon as we get off the recording, I'm going to go try to play because I really want to play them before the close of the competition. Um, do you have anything you want to call out as interesting or that you really want to check out but haven't yet? Well, I tried a couple that I bounced I, off of, lightly bounced. I, I did play all of A Woman's Choice, uh, which is about choosing not to have kids. It ended up not being how I would have treated the topic, Um <clears throat> It was kind of uneven, I think, uh, but I've also heard some people say they really liked it. So if you're interested in it, um, I think that I'm very interested that everybody has had a very different take on it. Mm. So it might be if you're interested at all in the subject matter, it might be worth checking out. Yeah, sometimes these though, very personal games like that end up being, you know, uh, uh, lots of lots of high numbers, lots of low numbers on the scoring. Yeah, and so I will look at it as a potential golden banana of Discord. That is a people very, very wildly. I think that, you know, I, I could see quality in it. It's just at times it was more straightforward, a little more obvious than I would have wanted it to be. But I'm also more versed on the topic than most. So on a completely different thing, I also for a completely different reason, bounced off of Let's Explore Geography Canadian Commodities Tractor Simulation Exercise by Carter Sand. <laughs> and That one's a mouthful. It's because... It, okay, so you literally log in, and if it's not built on a piece of educational software, I am shocked because, it, like, literally there's, like, options to log in from Google and like, you know, a lot of things like you put in like a classroom code. So either someone has put a lot of effort into making a fake classroom software or they found one. And if you, you made a fake one, like great job, you fooled me. Um, it is interesting because you get kind of, you're a long haul trucker. There's a map. There's like a, you know, a teacher's guide. And it definitely talks about it like you're using it in a classroom. And you get a, you know, you're told that you're in, I think you start in Ottawa. I'm clearly not Canadian. The theme of this is I know nothing about Canada, which will come increasingly clear. No, I think you're in, you're in Toronto because you get to go to the CN Tower. Hmm. So you can either like refill your car, go to a hotel, um, trade commodities, or 
go sightseeing and whatever the option is. So I, of course, went straight to the CN Tower. Um, I think you only have 30 days to do whatever you want to do in your your long haul trucker. I didn't realize that I that I could immediately buy stuff because I had money and I thought I had to go to another city to pick up stuff. So I start driving on the highway and then they tell me I can get off at different exits. So I just take the first exit and then they're like, oh, there's nothing here. Stay in a hotel. (laughs) Or would you like to stay in a motel? So I stay in a motel. And then I get back on the road and I was like, cool, on to uh, to where did I go? I went to Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. So I was like, keep going north to Sudbury. And I'm like, not going to get off at any more exits. You can't fool me, game. (laughs) So I drive to Sudbury. And they're like, would you like to go to the Dynamic Earth Science Museum and see the giant Canadian nickel? I was like, yes, I do. So I saw the giant Canadian nickel, and it gave me some facts about this Canadian nickel. Um, And I was like, again, I was like, is this real? Or are they making it up because... Yeah, I don't even know if Sudbury is a real place. It doesn't sound real to me. I looked it up. It's real. Okay. So there's really a giant nickel. Good good job, Canada. Giant, you fooled me. 12-sided Canadian nickel that's 30 <laughs> feet tall in Sudbury. And they give you a map. But, like, it's just a map of Canada with freeways on it and, like, cities. But it's, it's, it's like, I don't know anything about this. It would be like if I had a map of, like... Montana, and it was like tiny towns in Montana. Like, I don't know Montana. I know less about Canada. So I'm literally (laughs) just driving around Canada blindly. I go like Sudbury, and they're like, buy a bunch of nickel pallets. And I was like, that makes sense. There's a giant nickel here. Yeah. I should buy nickel here. And they're like, the townspeople, like the other options are like, would you like to sell me grain or a t-shirt pallet? And I was like, maybe I was supposed to buy these in Toronto. (laughs) But I didn't know. Where do you get grain in Canada? Nobody knows. Nobody's ever been to Canada. I have like a hundred thousand dollars. I have a huge amount of money. Which is like a hundred and ten thousand dollars in US money, right? Or something like that. (laughs) So I'm using radio buttons. I'm sightseeing. I'm buying stuff. I'm blindly trading it. I'm not paying attention to like it would be as if like me, Laura decided that I was going to be a commodities trainer in the United States, but I knew nothing about industry. And I like drove to Appalachia and they were like, hi, we sell coal here. And I was like, great, I'm going to buy all your coal. And then I just was like, where in the United States do I sell coal? I don't I know. Don't and know I know either. less about Canada. So <laughs> I blindly drove around Canada for like 10 days in the game and then I looked at the walkthrough, the teacher's guide, and it was like, oh, in 30 days, you're, you know, it depends on how good you are. I just drove around looking at weird roadside attractions in Canada. I, I have a question for you, like two, two questions, <laughs> actually. So I, I, think I, have, I think I have two questions for you. One is that, like, do you think that th- this qualifies as interactive fiction? Obviously, I'm kind of big tent on this kind of thing, but it sounds like a simulator and not like a not like a story story-driven thing at all? So what I can relate it to is if where in the USA is Carmen San Diego was actually about commodities trading in Canada and there was nobody you're chasing for a murder. And there's no story to it other than the commodities trading? I mean, no. You're just in your car. I mean, like, the story is you exploring Canada. I don't think it's, I don't, I, it's debatably interactive fiction. I kept thinking something meta and weird was going to happen. That's exactly what I was going to ask my other questions. Like, like, maybe if I find, like, maybe if I do take that weird exit off of Municipal Road 55, I'm going to, and again, that might not be in the game. I am currently looking at the Wikipedia article for the Big Nickel in Sudbury. <laughs> um, and it said it's off of Municipal Road 55. I'm not saying that Municipal Road 55 is in the game. Um, it's a very surprisingly robust Wikipedia article, by the way. Um, <laughs> anyway, I I just was like, yeah, I did about as well in the game as I would if you drop me in a in any foreign country and ask me to drive around and trade commodities. Like, I don't know anything about the industries of rural Canada. Yeah. 
and I had no way of learning other than getting in my car and driving up the freeway. I can't help but feel like there's there's like a hidden game here. Like we got we got at least one person on Twitter telling us that that they said it's ridiculous how much I am enjoying the Canadian geography game. Thank you, uh, John Gibson. Oh, I I enjoyed seeing all the tourist traps. I just was like, I don't. I feel like I'm missing a huge part of the game. I have to feel like, like there's like there's like a there's like a hidden thing here. Like some somehow you you end up in the wrong town and get framed for murder or something. Like there has to well, be something I did get here. To, <laughs> I I did not realize that I was supposed to go to bed and I got pulled over by the cops. Huh. So maybe if I like kept not sleeping, like vampires would get me i don't know i don't know what happens in canada are there vampires in canada <laughs> there might be um anyway i i can't even say i bounced off of it because i played it for 15 minutes i just just like puzzled by the game and again maybe if i was from canada i would be having not more fun but like again it was for me, the fun was I know nothing about Canada and I went to what I thought were made up towns but are real towns and looked at their tourist trap. And that's entertaining. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a great way to have a virtual vacation in Canada, if nothing else. I, and I am not sure if it's interactive fiction, but it was definitely a thing I did for a while and found <laughs> hilarious. So, well, that sounds really cool. I, uh, if listeners, if you played more of if you found like a secret game in this game and the answer was that I should have taken that exit, please let me know. Yeah, if you if you played more of Let's Explore Geography, Canadian Commodities Trader Simulation Exercise by Carter Sand, and you discovered you discovered the true meaning of life buried deep within the commodities trading simulation, let us know. We want to know more about this game. But maybe maybe not so much that we want to do that much exploring of Canada. I think it plays it straight. Yeah. Weird. I haven't found anybody saying, like, these are the eight secret clicks and then it's a murder mystery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, sounds really neat. I don't know. I'm glad it's in the comp. Weird stuff. Uh, there are a bunch of games that uh, I, I'm super hoping to get to before the close of the comp, but haven't had enough time to really play, uh, you know, in a, enough to talk about on this show. Um, I, I'm really interested in trying Dungeon Detective. It has great art, and I like the idea of a Dungeon Detective. Um, I like uh, horror games, and I'm looking forward to trying Polish the Glass. I've heard it compared to My Father's Long, Long Legs, which really was a creepy, creepy game. So um, that sounds cool. Um, I'm hoping to play Stone of Wisdom. I'm also really excited about um, the Origin of Madam Time uh, because mm. uh, I've it's the sequel to Al the the owl consults so i hopefully nate covers it in this episode we will see yeah probably um and uh the temporal of shoregill by arthur DiBianco because it's puzzly and i like very silly very very heavy puzzle games um and i haven't played a ton of parser this year so yeah i super respect arthur DiBianco, but these days i find myself steering clear of his work not because i don't think it's good like those are really good games but I'm almost always completely stymied by them. The puzzles on they the often show. end up like lo like Reagan writes a little note in the spreadsheets. It's like I started this game. Laura, please play this game. Yeah, <laughs> he's really known for doing pretty complex puzzly games. Mm. Reagan liked uh, Grandma Bethlinda's variety. Yeah, box. yeah, that was way back in 2015, and um, it was really good. It was a very like. Uh, it, it kind of reminded me of like a goofy version of the the room is very much like a like a game entirely revolving around uh, solving weird little puzzles to open a, a sort of magical puzzle box. Um, but his games have gotten progressively uh, more. He's clearly like honed his puzzle creation skills over the years. That was 2015. And that was like I could just barely complete that one. But then after that, he did. um Inside the Facility, which did really, really well in the comp, I think, in 2016. And I couldn't get very far in it. Its puzzles were a little over my head. And then The Wand from 2017 was, like, really clearly incredibly well-constructed and also so beyond my level. Like, 
I, 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 I gave up after maybe an hour and I didn't think I'd even really scratch the surface of it. So he's a great one to watch if you love these sort of really deep puzzles in parser based games. Um, if you're if you're the puzzle dunce like me, you might want to steer clear. That's sort of what I ended up doing this year. I probably would have played Temple of Shoregill, but like I was like, I I just I just know I'm not going to be able to beat it. So I'll I'll leave that to other folks. Yeah, I was more excited uh, to play math puzzles right off the bat this year, um, but I will hit up uh, Arthur DiBianca's work uh, uh, in probably when I go hang out with my husband in San Diego and we are tired of the beach we will curl up with a very hard puzzle game before bed yeah because we're dorks yeah throw that into frots on your phone and like you know curl up and play that it sounds like a really cool game but I I uh, I, I, I didn't I decided not to even attempt it this year just after after several years in a row of, of bitter uh bitter failures at the hands of Arthur D. Bianca's incredibly good puzzles Hey, someone's got to play all of the weird, porny, depressive <laughs> games for us. I mean, yeah, for long-term listeners, like Reagan's good at finding like cat torture games and kids locked in dungeons. Like he always seems to find some real dark, messed up games, and we are so happy because the games are great, and Reagan plays them, <laughs> and we get to hear about them and make fun of Reagan, which is one of our favorite things. Yep. Love it. And now, Shane and Nate. <laughs> Laura, thank you for joining me. I'm sorry we have you have to go. And uh, we'll be cutting now to uh, more discussion of IF Comp. We're bringing in Shane and Nate. Hi, folks. Laura and I originally intended for this to be a quick segment that I would edit together with my discussion with Nate and Shane. But as you can see, we talked for about an hour. So rather than have a massive episode, I'm splitting this one in two. And we are going to release it in two parts. So you'll be hearing just my discussion with Laura on this one. And then coming very shortly, we'll have another recording discussing some more games with Shane and Nate. And that will be the actual close of our IF Comp coverage for 2018. Thanks and join us soon for another episode of The Short Game.